Thanks, Renee. And thank you for continuing, well, I can't say continuing, but beginning the theme that I had for today. And um, the theme was memories. I suppose I would be the only one who needs to have stick it notes or needs to have a big box on my calendar so I can write down my appointments or the things I have to do. I even have to write a note, write out annual report because I'll forget. It's very embarrassing when you get to a meeting and you're supposed to present a report and you haven't done it. I guess the story amplifies what I'm saying. There was an elderly couple in their 90s. They went to the doctor and the doctor checked them over and they said, what is a doc? And the doctor said, physically you're fine. He said, I'm a little bit worried about your mind. He said, I think your memory is not the best. I think you should write little notes. So that night, they were sitting there watching TV and the husband gets up and says, I think I'll go to the kitchen. She says, if you're going to the kitchen, could you get me something? And he said, yes, of course. She said, I'd like a bowl of ice cream. Okay, he said. She said, don't you need a note to remember? No, he said, I won't forget that. So he goes in, and as he's walking in, she said, well, soon you're going to get me a bowl of ice cream. I'd like some strawberries. You need a better writer note, that. No, 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 he says. Well, she says, now that you've got this ice cream and strawberries, could you put some cream on top? He said, sure. She said, you sure you don't need a note? He said, no. Ice cream, strawberries, cream. Simple. 20 minutes later, he comes back and hands her a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> and she says to him, where's my toast? <laughs> saying anybody here is like that at all. <laughs> what do you like as a patient? What do you like as a patient? Have you, like me, you get the man flu, you know, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to anybody and you're the sickest there ever was, or perhaps you might be Superman, you know, yeah, hey, don't worry about that, or perhaps you might be a pussycat and you might need plenty of attention and stroking. Perhaps it might be a Rip Van Winkle. You know, you just want to sleep all the time. We're going to have a look at a reading now, and it's called John. John chapter 5. We're going to read the first 14 verses. <clears throat> um, I don't think that's the reading that I had. Perhaps I've given Kim the wrong reading. Would that surprise you? No. Did you not buy a sticky note? Did I have a right note on that one? I better go and check. I've got them, I've got them here, so it won't take long. John chapter 5. Seven on the mount? Well, that's John chapter 15. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, that's not. Oh, we've got John 15. Yes. That's why. Sorry, did I give you 15? I'm not sure. I probably did. Okay. Well, don't worry. We'll, we'll have a look at John 15, 1 to 5. John 5, I mean, 1 to 5. We're getting there, aren't we? You know, that's why there's a lot of empty seats. They know I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. After Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days, the side of the city near the Sheep Gate was the Pool of Beth Esther, where five covered porches, crowds of sick people, blind lame or paralysed, lay on the porches. One of the men laying there 
had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew how long he had been there, been ill, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to help me into the pool when the waters are stirred. While I am lying, uh, while I am trying to get there, someone else always gets in ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your sleeping mat and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up the mat and began walking. I don't know about you, but if you would want to know a picture of what it was like at the pool of Bethesda or the pool of Siloam, whatever one, it's the same, you would need to get a picture of it by having a look at the streets of Calcutta or Bombay or something like that. There you would find beggars you would find teeming people, you would find need, you would find smells, there would be open drains, and there were things that were all unpleasant. There would be noises that you wouldn't be familiar with. Wouldn't be much different if you went to the pool at Bethesda. Now, I don't know about you, but I would know that the pool of Bethesda would have been there. And if I had to go to a certain part, I wouldn't go through there. I would try to dodge it. Why? Because there'd be too many demands on me. I wouldn't like to have to deal with people having need. Just as well, Jesus is not like me. <laughs> he decided to walk through and when he did, he went to this man. Now, this man had been paralyzed for 38 years. And he said to him, Don't you want to be healed? Well, he explained to him why he still wasn't healed about how the waters have been stirred and others get in ahead of him. But why would Jesus ask this man who had been paralysed for 38 years, would you like to be healed? It's like saying to the Pope, are you a Catholic? Or saying to Michael, do you really want to give hampers out on Wednesday? Or saying to Neil, do you want to be on the music team? It's what they call axiomatic. It goes without saying. You don't have to ask somebody, do you want to be healed when I've been atrophied, muscles dead for 38 years? But two things happened. Two things happened. Jesus told him to get up. Big thing, get up and walk. Muscles atrophied for 38 years. And what happens? He gets up and he walks. Can you imagine the people around? It doesn't discuss that. It doesn't say anything about that. I reckon there would have been a lot of gasps. There were a lot of, oh, look at this. But that wasn't all. Jesus asked him, pick up your bed now. And he bends over and he picks up his bed. But, you know, it wasn't a slumber land, it wasn't a, a bed city bed that had in a spring mattress or head and foot. 
No, there's a bed roll. That's what they had. He picks it up and rolls it up and put it under his arm. Then he goes off to the synagogue and shows everybody what had happened. <coughs> He'd done two things. First of all, he picked up his bed. That was the Sabbath. So that was a cross. And then he went up to the synagogue. Another big cross. Wasn't allowed. Also, Jesus got a big cross. Where is all these crosses coming from? Of course it was from the religious leaders at the time. He wasn't allowed to heal somebody on the Sabbath. Goodness me. Should never have it. But why did he ask him to pick up his bed and take it with him? I'll tell you why. Because it's what we've been talking about today. Remembering. It's the sign of his freedom. It's the sign of his release. It's the sign of his being freed from another 38 years of being a par paralytic. When he sees that bedroll, he remembers what had happened. Yep. He remembers the past. He remembers now that he's got a future. I suppose as I look at that story and I thought about it I got nothing to talk about I shouldn't look at that guy and say oh you you're a lucky cow <laughs> what happened to me what happened to you you were lifted out of your barrenness your bankruptcy, you had nowhere to go before you knew Jesus. And we needed to have a sign, don't we? We've got another reading. It's from Numbers. We've got that one right, Kim? We've got a reading from Numbers. Joshua. <laughs> no! No! It's Numbers. Can you get to the Numbers one? Thank you. <laughs> This is all pun. <laughs> just to keep you awake. Right. And the Numbers 1 says, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel throughout the generations to come. You must make tassels on the hems of your clothing and attach them with a blue cord. When you see the tassels, you will remember and obey all the commands of the Lord instead of following your own desires and defiling yourselves as you are prone to do. Don't be very smug. We can do the same. We can get so caught up with the things and the pursuits of this world that we can forget about from where we've come. But Jesus has brought us this far. And we can get so caught up and we need reminders of how we've been delivered and what we've been delivered upon. I'm not expecting to see cardigans and coats with tassels on next Sunday. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, I'm sure. But it's so important that we have something that we can see. Something that we can see that will remind us of where we've come. Second story. It's in three stories today. You know the story of the children of Israel being led out of Egypt, don't you? You've all seen the movie The Ten Commandments. Well, you've seen the movie The Exodus, so you don't really need to know anything more. Well, you know that story. You know how they were miraculously saved from the last plague, the children of Israel, and led out into the wilderness by Moses. And of course, in a week or two, 
God had said to them that you'll be going into the promised land and so they were looking forward to that. But what happened? They were naughty boys and girls and they didn't listen to God very closely or wanted to. So he sort of said to them, well, okay, guys, now you might have to wait a little bit longer to go to that promised land. Well, a little bit longer ended up being 40 years, wasn't it? So we now come to this part of the story and we've got the Joshua reading, haven't we, Kim? I know we've got that one. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And um, let's have a look at the Joshua reading. When the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose twelve men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take twelve stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. And he told them, go to the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up a stone and carry it out on your shoulder. Twelve stones in all, one for each of the tribes of Israel. Forty years later they arrive at the river Jordan. This was the time. This was this momentous moment in the history of the Israeli nation. They are now about to claim God's promise, the promised land. But God had a few things for them to do a little bit before, three days before this event. He said to Joshua, you must prepare the people to go into the promised land. First of all, during this time, you need to purify yourselves. You need to wash I thought he must have been talking about um, British backpackers. But, you know. <laughs> he said, you need to wash. You need to wash your clothes. You need to abstain from hanky-panky at night. No sex. Because God is going to do a wonder among you. And so it was that the priests lifted the ark and prepared to cross into the river. The Jordan was now in flood. It was in flood. <coughs> and it was a mile across. As the priest's feet went into the water, it receded. God's in the business of making waters recede. And it receded back five to eight miles. So there was dry ground for the children of Israel to cross. And as the priests lifted the ark and carried it to the middle, there was 12 stones taken and placed for them to stand on. And the people of Israel passed in front of it. Wouldn't have taken long. There's only 2 million of them. So they crossed. And then as they came to the other side, God said to Joshua, look, you are here. God has kept his promise. God has kept his promise, but what will happen down the years you will forget. So I want you to get those stones that the priest stood on and picked up and made up into a memorial, into a can, so that when your children and when others were asked, what does this mean? You can tell them. You can tell them the wonder of how the people had been led across. You know, I was thinking about it and I was thinking, you know, God could have made it a bit easier. He could have just got a bridge, couldn't he? Or a ramp or something across. It reminded me of the story. God had chosen someone in Australia to bless and he said to him, I'll give you three wishes. That's all you get. What's the first? He said, I want to have enough money that I don't need 
to worry about it. I don't want to be a millionaire. I just need enough money. Okay, God says, give God. Straight away, God. And he said, how about health? He said, can you give me a good life for whatever time I've got? I'll, I'll take that. So God said, you've got it. And the third thing, he said, well, I've got a lot of friends across the ditch. Must have been related to a name. I've got a lot of people in New Zealand. Could you get a bridge built from Brizzy to New Zealand? I thought about it. He said, look, he said, that's a lot of logistics. He said, that's a lot of logistics. He said, have you really, really thought about what it would take? He said, you wouldn't have another request, would you? And the guy said, well, I'd really like to understand my wife better and to know what she's thinking. And God says, how many names on that bridge do you want? <laughs> That's awful. I know I won't get out of your life. But <laughs> God wanted to remind them of their story, their experience, and how they depended on Him, how they needed Him. So when the people in the future would ask, What do you mean by these stones? they would be reminded. And the proof that God had worked <coughs> his miracles, his stuff yeah. mm. with them. You know, when you're in the flow with God's people, you don't need to be surprised when he shows up amongst us, do you? We've got another reading. In Luke 22, 1 to 19. Thanks, Kim. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. He replied, As soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him at the house he enters. Say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you to an upstairs large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that it will not last, that you will, I will not eat this meal again until the its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God Then he said take this and share it among yourselves for I will not drink this wine again until the kingdom of God has come he took the bread and gave thanks to God for it then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. You might be saying, look Ron, your sermon's too long this morning, but you see, it's a communion talk also. Anybody have a special place that they like to go to, that have something to eat? Is there some special time that you share Occasions? Can you remember them? Are they important? Is there somewhere where you always like to go for a special occasion? I guess there is. For all of us, we have those special occasions in our life marked. And how do we do that? We call people together. We call our family, our friends, or whatever. Why? Because we want to share a meal together. It's important to share that time together. 
it makes it very special. Jesus was no different. He had friends. He wanted to share a special meal together with those friends. But also, he wanted to leave a legacy for those to come. As well as the last line, do this in remembrance of me. You know, they were coming to share together in the Passover meal. And you know the story of the Passover. The Passover was something that needed to be remembered each year by God's people. How they were taken away from a life of slavery and being freed. Freed by what? Freed because they followed the instructions that they were told. They put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts so that they would be freed from death. Amazing. Freed because of the blood of the lamb. What was the second one? Jesus said, this is a new covenant I'm preparing for you and me, he says. This is a new agreement. I want to introduce a new covenant. A new covenant that only a man could fulfill. And isn't that true? as we come to celebrate. <coughs> Nothing else could atone for your and my sins. Nothing else. This meal that he shared, he wanted us to continue to share, to remember, to remember him for his love and for his sacrifice. <coughs> Wonderful, merciful Saviour. Precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men. Isn't that profound? Mm -hmm. Isn't that one most of the wonderful songs that we had in these last few years? And he goes on to say, you offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost their way. Amen. Mm -hmm. I can identify it. You have given the healing and the grace our hearts always long for. Here, in our weakness, you find us falling before your throne. Let's sing it. Mm -hmm.